outcroppings. So right now we're looking for those outcroppings to see if we can find high density um, locations with corals. And then we're going to take photographic imagery of that, and then that's going to go back to the University of Puerto Rico for further study. Thank you, Dan. Here's a fun question. Someone asked, are there any sports recreational facilities on board? We do have a little gym. It has a few um, exercise equipment, weights, treadmill, I think. I've been yeah. terrible. Treadmill, elliptical, yeah. Yeah. Uh, little weight system, some yoga mats, dumbbells. Yeah, you have to sign up for a time right now due to COVID protocols. They only want one person using the gym at a time. Um, but we do have a very nice lounge with TVs, but it's always streaming what you guys are watching at home right now. And we also listen to SBL in the lounge. And um, But there's lots of books and stuff like that. So yeah, we're our, our entertainment is watching what you guys are watching right now and listening to me talk right now too. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone in the lounge. <laughs> uh, so navigation, uh, wh where, where are we headed? You're off to SBL. Do you think you could say that, repeat that on SBL for us? Sorry, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we are moving about 30 meters mostly west, uh, and that will put Ada kind of in the middle of this triangle feature that you can see on our Norbit map, and that'll give Hercules a chance to kind of explore and see if we find anything on the edges of this uh, vaguely outlined feature that we have. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the comment in the chat is saying, yesterday's theme was Taylor Swift, and today our theme seems to be Alaska. We keep reverting back to talking <laughs> about Alaska throughout this shift. Uh, so we had a question saying that they know we're on a ship, but still, why are COVID protocol still in effect? So that's a good question. We actually um, just took a second round of COVID um, testing. So we, if you notice watching, none of us are wearing masks anymore. So we are all COVID free. The reason COVID is still in effect is because COVID is still around. Um, I know at my school, I'm, every once in a while, I still have kids that get sick with COVID. And so we really just don't want to have COVID, come on board and just wipe out everyone on the ship. So we do take effects that when you fly in, um, when you get first get to Honolulu, you're not really allowed to go to many other places. We want to keep your exposure minimum. You're supposed to wear a mask on the airplane. And then the first five, we take a test before we get on the board. Like at the dock, we take a COVID test. And then once we're COVID, um, that comes back. Oh, and we have to take a COVID test before we leave too. So 72 hours before arrival or flights, depending on, like I was in Hawaii, so I just, before arrival, but those leaving, 72 hours before departure, you had to take a COVID test. And then right when you got to the dock, you had to take a COVID test before you boarded the boat. And then everyone had masks on and we took another round of COVID tests today after breakfast. And so now that everyone came back negative, we are all free of masks. Tomorrow though, we are having a couple crew change. So um, some members are gonna get on a boat and go get um, a nice little cruise ride over to the Big Island and they're going to be flying it's out and we're going to get some new members on and so our new on signers will have to wear masks until they pass their five days and the rest of us I think can still stay mask free. So those are our COVID protocols and why we're still in effect because viruses just don't disappear. So as you see, you know, uh, we're not getting a lot of coral here because the substrate just is loose and they just can't, you know, can't survive on it. So we're looking for more hard substrate for outcroppings, that type of stuff. So that's what we're 
was hoping to see. Yeah, because where we saw the six gill and the goose fish was all in those rocky areas. Yeah. So. As you can see, the oh. sand ripples there. So now we're coming up to the rocky area. Might have got your wish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. The trusty Norbit didn't lead us wrong again. Yeah. Oh, that's quite the sheer ledge there. And there we go. Wow. Do you want to turn cameras on? I think you just have to hit enter. Yep. <laughs> now, I've been, I've been looking at like so many different, I have, I have I have 10 different command line windows open right now. I forgot which one yes. I'm supposed to look at. <laughs> All right, yeah, we are officially, uh, we're taking pictures. We're taking three pictures at the same time. Uh, if you look on uh, satellite feed three, sat three. Um, so one of the things we added to that view recently was we turned on the, um, for a while we were just streaming the, the center cam of Triclops, which is like a kind of like a like a high-end motion picture camera, um, but the it's got a relatively normal lens on it. This is what you might like use to shoot like a Hollywood movie. Um, but we've added in the lower left and the lower right corners. Those are the the fisheye views, and you know it's uh, the reason for those is because they give you a really wide view. I mean, it's a little bit hard to look at it because the image, the live image, is distorted. But in software, we're able to basically cancel that out. And now we can say, oh, you know, now we've got this really massive 220 degree view. And uh, this particular imaging mode is uh, a test for basically the, the VR headsets. So it's, these are meant to be in the alignment that human eyes would be in. Although there are other different modes that we've been using to test photogrammetry. I have a question in the chat asking where the next excursion for Nautilus will be and if she'll be heading to California. So Nautilus is not heading to California. It's going to stay in Hawaii. Um, you can check out our nautiluslive.org website and it has all the information about all of our different excursions. After this one, there's two more excursions. So NA1, this one is NA156, the next one is NA157, and it's going to be exploring the economic exclusion zone, the EEZ of Hawaii, the main Hawaiian islands. So the near shore islands are very well mapped, but not the EE zone, just the offshore of it. So it's going to be kind of mapping that area. Oh, looks like quite a large anemone up there at the top. So, science team, can you advise us on what you'd like us to do here? Would you, how would you like us to move around this feature? Uh, if you can just move across it as fast as you can, like uh, scroll, scroll to the left and then scroll to the right. Okay, so similar to what Dan was doing yeah. earlier. Yeah, uh, because you know the the farther we are for pictures, the better. We're taking the picture once every three seconds, so the farther you move, the less overlap we have on pictures, which is actually easier for us to process. Roger that. Okay. You want us to start somewhere near the bottom? I'm about eight meters up right now. Yep, and then yep. just work your way up. Okay. And then Thank you. See the pillows there? Yeah, those are nice little pillows. Oh, those are really neat. Some nice columnar there. Yeah, so for our, our viewers, the idea here is that we kind of uh, typewriter our way across this feature. So we go left to right, so and then up, and then right to left, and then up, and left to right again. So we're kind of scanning back and forth across this thing with overlapping images um, as we move, both from left to right and up to bottom. And with all of those overlapping images, we can tie common points together. Uh, in uh, our software to tie all of these images into one big image and also reconstruct uh, this structure that we're seeing in front of us. And so um, this is a nice way for us to bring the seafloor in uh, excellent detail and recreate it back in the lab for uh, 
us to look uh, at patterns of, of why things are living where they are and also to create some of these more immersive experiences that we were talking about earlier. In the chat, I had someone asking who the crew member was that was telling us the awesome description about the cameras, and that is Rachel. Um, you've probably been hearing Rachel and Jonathan swap in and out on it, and she is not listed on the watch because they're kind of a part of all watches. They are the watch. They <laughs> are the watch. <laughs> There's uh, actually the real reason I'm not listed on the page is because I forgot to fill out the form. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I will make sure to do that <laughs> tonight. <laughs> um, I, I did not get my picture yeah. taken, and I also did not do the paperwork. So. And so that shows how important she is, is that she can get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And I think I'm actually, I'm sitting in the, the science one position. You are. I, my, my usual working spot is down in the data lab, um, but or in the rack room, but I've, I'm uh, up here because we're, you know, very involved in this dive and it's helpful to know if something breaks, we can fix it. But yeah. And then we've also had a question about crew change. So Travis, I'm going to put this one to you since you're one of the ones that's our off signers. They want to know if this crew cycle is just a normal one where you change often, or they didn't know how to put this, but they didn't want to uh, put it nicely. If you got a new job, <laughs> and that's why you're abandoning us. <laughs> uh, the, this transfer wa was pre-planned and uh, for me at the University of Puerto Rico, I have to get back uh, to yeah. my daily duties of, of teaching in person. They'd only let me leave for so long in the semester. Uh, so that's why I'm hopping off. Uh, I don't know. Uh, There's a couple people hopping off. Yeah, how common or how planned these are for, for other typical cruises. Uh, I guess it depends on the mission and, and where where the ship's going. Dan, how, how common is it for people to do mid-cruise change? I think it really depends on the cruise. You yeah. know, what what are they looking after, and do they need expertise on and off? And they just, you know, they, they do this when that's needed. And I think this one, too, because we are right next to the Hawaiian Islands. It's it's very it's, easy. It's yeah. not like it, we have to, when we went out to Papa Nao, Moko Kea, I think it was like a three-day transit, you know, so people couldn't just hop on and hop off. So... Yeah, I was going to say, um, there, so the last on the list who I was on, we also did a, uh, we had a crew change the midway through, and that was a scenario where, you know, we, we were looking, it was an arch we were doing some archaeology dives, and we had a couple experts who were, you know, we were also, we were pretty close to the mainland, and usually for, you know, this is, we're very close to the Hawaiian coast, because uh, of the features we're looking at, but the, you know, if, if there is a, a location that we're going to that's really far out then usually we'll have scientists remotely participate through the you know remote telepresence tools I think it's funny, the change in goosefish, right? The first one we saw, we spent like 15 minutes looking at it, and now it's like, oh, look, a goosefish, and you just keep on going. <laughs> they are one of the few fish that work good in models, though, because they, they don't move the whole time <laughs> we go across. <laughs> they they are, come out they're great. a rare breed for us for that. They also provide great tie points. If we ever have a, a lack of model cohesion, uh, mm -hmm. we often look for those bright white features uh, that don't move. <laughs> and. Uh, those really fit the bill for that one. Cause they're so thank you, distinct. Goosefish. Has anyone ever gone to the Seattle Pike Market? You know, like the famous market where they throw the fish? Yes. Well, there's like, in one of those, in the big stall where they're like the most famous for throwing the fish, there's this fake monkfish, which is also another name for Goosefish, because they can get quite large. and. If you like sit there and you put your face too close to look at it, the people can make it move. And so it looks like the fish is jumping out at you. And it's really funny to sit there and watch people <laughs> get scared by yeah. the monkfish. Pike Place Market. Yeah, Pike, Pike Place. So go check out the monkfish at Pike 
Place. <laughs> Isn't there a uh, Starbucks blend called Pike Place? Yeah, it's it's because uh, Starbucks started in Seattle, so and I think I, and the first original Starbucks is at Pike Place Market, I believe, yep, and right. it's a massive line. I've like, gone by it, but I've never actually gone into it because um, it's too long. I don't know if you can have a look there and your screens up forward if somebody wants to take that down. Yep. Yeah, we'll uh, go ahead and take care of that. Uh, video, can we change that three? Sure. Can't fix that? I think she has to run to the lab to do that. Okay. Yeah. Smile, everybody. You're on TV. Hi. Now you guys can't read who's ever emailed that was. <laughs> Alrighty. Have you guys completed uh, the survey? Uh, we've moved back and forth a few times. I'm not sure if we've reached the top of it. Yeah. Okay. Travis, in your career of studying corals, where has been your place in the world you've seen the most beautiful, most diverse corals? Wow, yeah, that's a, a great question. One of the interesting things uh, about my, my coral reef career is that uh, usually we go to the places where uh, we don't see the great corals. <laughs> 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 we try to go to... Um, so you study. So what you're telling me is you're a coral guy who doesn't go scuba diving in beautiful tropical coral reef areas. Well, they're still beautiful, but there's. <laughs> we, I spend a lot of time on more degraded reefs <laughs> and not these really pristine ones that you might have seen on nature documentaries. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is because uh, a lot of our work is really shallow, trying to understand the interaction between uh, corals and the overlying chemistry, and. A lot of those chemical changes are a lot smaller, smaller, yeah. in, in deeper waters. Um, but uh, certainly, the places where I've seen the most most beautiful coral uh, has been probably uh, Dongsha Atoll, or maybe the Spratly Islands over by the um, sort of the Coral Triangle, and this is where sort of modern corals are thought to have originated. It's the highest region of biodiversity. Th there's a lot of... Uh, 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 yep, and so there's a lot of biodiversity there, a lot of uh, larval exchange. So reefs in that region, the Coral Triangle, sort of Indonesia, Philippines can be really spectacular in terms of their biodiversity and, and resilience and so and why are corals so sensitive to environmental changes i think like one way to put it is that um when we have uh uh one way to put it is that we have um, when you have a two degree fever, so we normally run at 98.6 degrees, and when we have a temperature of 100.6 degrees, we feel very bad. And you can think about that as the same way as corals. You know, they don't have that ability to control their body temperature. And so when we're looking at really warm situations that are much warmer than they're, they're used to, they're not able to handle that. Uh, it starts to sort of break down 
uh, their symbiosis with their algae that provides them with a lot of food. And so, you know, that's the way I like to think about it with corals and ocean warming. Um, and they're actually, you know, from my perspective, really resilient and hardy, hardy animals. Uh, some of them can, you know, live for extended periods of time in the dark. Some of them can be buried uh, for quite some time and, you know, come out from under the sand and still be alive. Uh, they can experience uh, pretty big changes in, in seawater uh, pH. Some of them are, you know, still surviving at CO2 vent sites. Uh, and so all of these things that the environmental change are making it harder for corals to grow. But um, yeah, ocean warming, it's like a big fever for them. That's the, that's the hard one. I agree with you. I think they're tougher than people think. Yeah. <laughs> I think people like to, uh, you know, just because you see somebody die and think they're so fragile and everything, but they are quite hard. They've been through a lot. Um, but obviously, like you said, like they can't, you know, if we get hot in the hot tub, we can just get out. They can't get out, yeah. right? That's where they are. And, you know, you can't tolerate that very long at all. So, um, yeah. And one of the things we were talking about just yesterday, Zach, is that there's corals that live in places that are completely exposed at low tide yeah. for several hours to direct sunlight. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, this, you know, they have these incredible adaptation mechanisms with protective sunscreens and, and mucus um, that helps to, you know, enable them to persist in those places. And some things are kind of funny too, like that same mechanism enables us to sort of ship corals for research more easily. So a lot of labs that I've worked with, instead of shipping them in bags of seawater, we'll actually just put wet newspaper on them oh, really? to keep them moist. And then they have that natural mucus to protect them during oh. transit. Um, Otherwise, the sort of the mucus being degraded by bacteria so in the white. water column uh, can cause more stress than than just that newspaper mucus. So, pretty incredible what they yeah. what they can endure. It's just uh, like all of us, they're better at uh, adapting to some things and uh, not so good at adapting to others. So we all have our strengths and weaknesses. One of our viewers commented that every organism is sensitive to changes and that changes in soils can also quickly kill plants too. And yes, that's definitely a big thing of looking at your different nutrients, your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium mixture of your soil, your NPK. And yeah, it's all a balancing act. I feel like this almost looks like we're going into a void. Yeah, getting pretty murky. Yeah. So our depth for those watching is 858 meters, and the temperature around Hercules is 5.26 Celsius. Daniela, Taylor Ann was saying uh, you guys were talking about the six skills being an uh, evolutionary trait, adaptations. You guys ever finished that conversation? Um, we were, talked about it. She said she's going to research yeah. into it a bit. So she left it up. I was reading into it. Oh, um, yeah? Yeah, it seems like it's evolutionary. It so, is evolutionary. Yeah, it's an old trait that they so used to have. That they used to have six, and they've yeah, evolved to only have five now. Yeah. Okay. And, and I mean, typically, right, it's, it's an energetics thing, right? Yeah. That they don't need to use the energy. They don't. Um, I'm not sure exactly the benefit between six versus five and, you know, how that energy would change. Um, but I mean, sharks and fish have evolved a lot. We, we know there's a lot of adaptation between them and gills or <laughs> fish um, rather than have a gill plate, right? They don't even have gill slits at all. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I, I think it would probably take an expert to really understand that transfer of, of oxygen across. Switch, yeah. Because yeah, it's, it's Cause quite fascinating. It but is fascinating because it's like you get more oxygen so what is the advantage of having less gills so yeah. absorbing less oxygen and getting rid of co2 slower yeah. as well right but if you don't need it i yeah. guess like if you don't need you it you lose, lose it, it. Yeah. yeah if you don't right? need it you lose it yeah there's yeah there's certain fish that have lost certain fins over time right because they don't yeah. use those fins and it's well, yeah, whales it's, it's actually a, have hip bones just floating there, yeah, right? They yeah. the legs have slowly yeah 
and I mean, even us with our tailbones, yeah, our appendix. Yeah. Who knows? Future humans might not even right. have an appendix. Yeah. So for any of those watching at home, feel free to write into the chat, ask any questions. Um, if you go to Nautilus Live, there's a little chat box, you can write it in. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, head on over to Nautilus Live so you can interact with us over here. So one of our viewers, Travis, said that the oldest known coral lived during the Cambrian period more than 500 million years ago and are still found living today so that they are very hardy creature, uh, creatures. Wow. Did the water look uh, kind of hazy to anyone? It does. Was it looks a, like... Is there a seep somewhere somewhere around here or was that just my, my eye? I, it did seem like the visibility decreased a bit there. Yeah. Okay. The temperatures didn't change at all? Do you have that? Um, I, earlier I said it was 5, and now it's 5.23. So, yeah. But I didn't keep a close eye of see if we had any jump on it or not. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, this looks like it could be a nice feature for us to image, if possible. Got a, got a couple of worms down there, it looks like even. Ooh, we got some color. What's that urchin? Yeah, is that a little pink urchin kind yeah. of? Yeah. Is it two feet out? It kind of looks like yeah. a little fuzzy. Oh, look, the crinoid. It's floating down. We were just talking um, about that. So right. Yeah, yeah. 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 great. Yeah. Now let's watch it run. Yeah, <laughs> it landed right on top of that other one, huh? I think just with what we're seeing in front of us there, I might um, might back off the wall, but still move south. So maybe rather than okay, a true south, it. just come a little bit southeast, just so we keep that in our. So uh, our cameras on. Okay, so cameras are on. So if you can uh, transect the wall, that would be great. Um. Do you want to transect the wall continuing on as we were, or just kind of the section that we just went past while the cameras no, were not? No, uh, we can continue on. Okay, got you. Let's see if another crinoid wants to do a leap of faith for us. Yeah. Bridge snap. That's the first time I've seen him yeah. drop as well. Let's step one five meters, yeah, bearing one seven zero. Thank you. <laughs> kind of reminded me of like Mary Poppins floating down with her umbrella. <laughs> Very elegant. Yes. yes. And it's kind of hard to imagine looking at these that these are actually animals. They're not what you typically think of as animal like. What's up? I think so, yeah. We're going to be kind of... Um, do you want to get some of the upper part of the wall at the photogrammetry back uh, row? Um, I, actually, Rachel, can you turn the fish eyes on the top so we can see on the, uh, on the screen for her? Okay. The fish eyes give us a pretty large view compared to this, so okay. we may have got the... If, if the it didn't look like this uh, wall was as tall, so we probably got it all in one, you know, swipe. Okay. 
Mm. Uh, so yeah, we're just going to continue on. It looks like the wall might be ending soon, according to our bathy. Um, I am moving out of land to at 170. TJ, I do see that little tiny hook there in our sonar that's uh, encroaching in our 20 meters, but I, th I think we'll be all right. We'll just keep an eye on it. Um, I think it's that, that little notch dead ahead in Atalanta. You can start to see the wall there right, right in front of you. And, you know, if we get enough. So one of our viewers is saying, please, please put triclops back on sat three. I don't think they want to look at our I faces I did a little anymore. bit, yeah. And if it's, um, <laughs> yep, we are good to go getting mark, triclops we'll on sat three. We need to, but I think we'll be okay. Just keep an eye on it. Yeah, I think so. I think we might just just pass over it. Can you find us another feature? <laughs> oh, whoa, what's going on here? Okay, um, you... I We just got brought a bit closer to the wall. Um, I don't know if that... So you might have to come up, actually. Um, so if you... You could back up towards him and we can try to... Uh, yeah, kind of traverse up. I don't... I don't know if you see that there, but the ship just made a dog leg. I, it might have been... A 270 instead of 170 move. Um, that's why we got closer. <laughs> Sorry about that. We'll just, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it looks like it went in. So as long as, yeah, it looks like you're now clear of it. You came up a bit, yeah? Is that? So he's clear of it now, um, but you're you're kind of at the, at the full length of your tether. So let me... Um, let me bring us uh, back into a safe zone here. I'm just going to kind of back us off the wall. Um, two zero meters, one three five. Bridge nav. Can we step two zero meters bearing one three five? Thank you. So we have one of our viewers saying coral, not just an animal, a whole colony of animals. When I was calling it, animal, I was talking about the crinoids being an animal, but coral, since it's a polyp, and this is like, I feel like is a mind boggling thing. Poly it's a colony of polyps, but I would still say coral is an animal, not animals, because all the coral polyps make up the animal. Travis, how would you ex say that? What would you, is, it, is coral animals or is it animal? This is a, uh really tricky one it kind of depends on your perspective i guess but each individual coral polyp is its own living animal but then they have shared connective tissue between them so they're sharing resources uh between them, each other as they sort of clone each other to make new polyps as they continue to grow and yeah the you know we like all animals there's also you know a range of uh, organisms sort of hosted within it, even here in the deep sea. While we wouldn't have the symbiotic algae, we also still have lots of bacteria and other things. Is that another skate? Another ray? Oh, yeah. yeah. Another another what? six skill ray. Two six skills in a day? I know. Wow. Yeah, one of the my things I like most about corals um, is, is what they're most closely related to. It always surprises people the phylum that they're in being the same as jellies, being cnidarians. Yeah. It's, it's that polyp stage, right? Polyp and medusa. And, um, yeah, corals are just, they really throw you for a curveball. When, you, yeah. when you're trying to understand how these are related and whatnot, coral is the one that will really mess you up. Well, jellyfish also have that polyp stage. Mm -hmm. So they go through a polyp stage where they almost look a little like coral. And so they have their sexual reproduction phase where they go land on the substrate and then they'll bud off and then you get a bunch of clones of the exact same one in the asexual phase, which results in your Medusa. Yeah. So. Uh, just checking in with Renato, are there some any other interesting uh, features coming up the slope here that we could focus on? I had Ignacio looking downstairs too, but. Yeah, we're um, we're just coming off the wall. We uh, we had a, sh a ship position uh, error, so coming off the wall. And then um, if I'm going to zoom out on high pack there, um, we're really just yes. against this uh, kind of this wall, kind of as it curves in and out. Turn your um, triclops off. Or keep it on. I don't triclops. know if you're seeing this kind of this region here is kind of what uh, the most interesting, and we probably have about you know half hour max left. 
um, on the bottom before we'll have to pull up. Rachel, you might think right, this sounds is good. Yeah. Thanks. interesting. Someone is generating 3D stereo visuals from our, our Triclops footage. Uh, they're uh, doing it from home? Yeah. Sweet, so yeah. They asked us because we had it off when we had our small glitch there for a bit, and then they asked us to put it back on and said that they're generating 3D stereo visuals from the footage. Yeah, it would be, so I guess uh, they're taking YouTube and basically just like taking uh, screen caps, or, or they're pulling the stream and just recording it locally and just like kind of cutting out the 3D cam views. Yeah, if you're, uh, I know you're just sending it in via text, but if uh, it'd be really interesting to learn about how you're doing that from shore. So feel free to write back in and let us know. I'm going to step south another uh, one five meters. I think we're probably going to start to become enough off the wall, and then I'll just head us uh, south a little bit. Maybe, maybe a little more. One six five. But uh, the intent is then to get into this kind of area here, so I don't want to go too far away. But I think we'll start to turn back in here. So from this perspective, kind of like around this corner here and there, um, but I think I'll need to give you a little more, I'll start to give you more leash. They're going to need about 10 it. minutes to get the ship moved. Okay, I'll just do a 10 meter south. Uh, yeah, I it sounds like maybe this will be our last uh, Bridge big now. feature to look at before we need to head up. Uh, 10 meter step south. Thank you. So I think we're back in the box here. If you want to um, do some photogrammetry on this uh, kind of this wall here to the right. All right, we're turning the cameras on. If we're ready. Yep, uh, we are rolling. All right, track clips on. Got it. Yeah, yeah, kind of like panning around there. I'll I'll do my best though. It's gonna <laughs> see what we uh, as we curveball around it uh, without getting out of lantern into trouble. I think we'll be all right though. Yeah, yeah. It kind of looks like the rubble field that we're seeing there is gonna allow for it. So. But we're getting a lot of good, uh, a lot of good species at the top of the ridge there. So thanks. Yeah, definitely. You get to get a close up of, of what's happening there. Hi. Um, so we got a comment back from our viewer unsure about their workflow for their doing uh, live uh, telepresence, live streaming photogrammetry from our here. So actually they're talking about using OBS and FFmpeg. So believe it or not, um, that view you're seeing, the three-way view where you've got the, the center, the cinema camera with a sort of a normal lens and the two, the port and starboard fisheye lenses, that is actually being made by an OBS machine on board. And uh, FFmpeg we use really heavily. Uh, we're using uh, reality capture for the actual photogrammetry part. But, um, but yeah, it sounds like, uh, you know, great minds think alike. <laughs> And I think also uh, speaks to the real power of open source software. Uh, I think, you know, 
one of our goals here was that we wanted to, you know, we want to be able to, I mean, we always want to do cool things, but we also want to be able to support open source projects and demonstrate that, you know, you really can do a lot with like, these tools that the communities put together. There's a huge amount of potential and power there. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it they, they work, they're functional, they're useful, they're things you can learn and they're very democratic. Well, I've noticed on our dives, we ha we always get a lot of shrimp, and I feel like shrimp just don't get the love. So, <laughs> um, anyone want to, Travis or Zach, want to talk a little bit about shrimp? I mean, deep water shrimp, I don't know much about. Um, I've heard one yeah. adaptation that deep water shrimp has, and so you know how like an octopus will ink, yeah. but I think I don't know if this is one species of deep water shrimp or they all have this ability, but they'll actually vomit, spew out bioluminescence. So if something tries to eat it, it'll like s cover them Interesting. with bioluminescence. Yeah. And so it like, can escape. And then hopefully that thing that ate them, something yeah. else will come along and eat that. Yeah. I mean, I've noticed their, like, their antennae are much longer too. Yeah. So yeah, maybe it's just like, <laughs> that's their last line of defense, yeah? <laughs> Same as like the octopus, it's like, spew something. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, they're they all pretty s like similar similar color. They're all been red too, so mm -hmm. I Very assume it's all Very vivid red. Yeah, and I assume it's just all one species. Because um, obviously being red down there, nobody's really seeing them. No one can see it because the red light spe yeah. or color spectrum gets absorbed out. So yeah. even though they look red to us, it's because of Hercules artificial light were shining on it, yeah. whereas that red color would be invisible to other species down there. Yeah, and they, you don't see them, you know, clustering up much either. We just see individuals all around. Um, I'm actually surprised we haven't seen more species of crustaceans in general. I mean, it's only been really shrimp. Yeah. Um, haven't seen a lot of crabs I or lobsters. I think we saw one squat lobster, but a squat yeah, lobster is not actually a lobster. Right. It's a crab. Yeah. There's a metallogorgia um, so, coral in the bottom part of the yeah, screen. Yeah, it's there. interesting. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know why. So we don't have a shrimp count going, but a previous um, expedition had started a shrimp count. And so shout out to Stephanie, I believe, mm. who was um, an SCF that started a shrimp count on an earlier expedition. Yeah, we'll see if we can kind of get in this little bowl here as much as we can. I could put Adelanta in and then we'll kind of end up going up because it's a little, it's not like quite a wall, but otherwise. Rock. We, it looks like we got a bit of leash right now, so oh, we got something, kinda something, something swimming there, bottom there. left yeah. side there. Looks like it actually looks like it squid. went faster. Kind of looks squid-like. Looks like it's got some some peck fins up on the head that are moving along. Huh? Too fast for us. Yeah. Sorry, what was that? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, that's good. I think you might be able to get a lot of this in here without putting Atalanta in there. Just because if it's steep enough and we got a bit of leash. Dan, is it okay for us to go back to Triclops now for that um, vid three? Yeah, so the video wants to go back to Triclops, that's fine.
All right, do you want me to bump Atalanta in, in there? Otherwise, um... Oh, is that another swimming crinoid? Yeah. I can bump a little, like ten meters into the uh, into the west there. I'll do that. Bridge nav. Ten meters step west. Thank you. And then any more. And I think I'd have to, we'll have to like climb the whole business up. Got some cool features in here. Someone commented about the shrimp having technicolor vomit. Yeah, I would agree. That would be a very apt description for it. Travis, do you have any fun, weird fact about the ocean that you think of most viewers might not know? Mm. I love coming up with fun, weird facts. I feel like the ocean has a lot of them. It's a good question. Lots of fun, weird things about the ocean. I just did a, a bump west. I don't think Atalantis felt it yet. Um, it's still a little slow. Yeah, it's starting to starting to go towards you now, but um, it'll at least allow us to kind of explore um, maybe all this area in here. Give us a bit of leash. Yeah, this area is looking great. So I think our cameras are frozen, so go ahead and explore as you wish until we get these reset. Roger that. We'll use okay. the main Zeus for the visuals. Yep. All right. Well, in the meantime, the I think a cool fun fact is that um, just as we have waves on the surface of our oceans, we also have internal waves. Um, and these waves can be hundreds of feet tall, and they're propagating between uh, different layers of the ocean. So these differences in density can, uh, that same in interface that's kind of the, where surface waves propagate, we have waves propagating between these different uh, layers of our ocean, and these can be really important for uh, mixing uh, and moving, uh, moving nutrients around in the ocean. So I think that's pretty cool that we have these huge, huge waves uh, right in the middle of the, the water column. These brittle, or these um, metallogorgia corals that we're seeing, they're the stalked one, with the little bit like kind of white at the top, and then they all have a individual ophioroid brittle star that lives on it. Um, that's kind of a, a defining feature of of Metallogorgia. The reason why it's called Metallogorgia is the um, skeleton itself, if you look at it, it's kind of got like a metallic sheen to it. Very cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, like I a gold. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They've, got the, um, they've got the stars and then they also have the skeleton. I think the Paragorgias also have the, the gold, gold kind of hue skeleton. I, mm -hmm. I might be mistaken, but... Right, yeah, the, the color and then the skeleton underneath has kind of a different... Mm -hmm. I 
Oh, is that possible? Yeah, if we can record now, let's go for mm. it. This is a w an interesting area for us. Oh yeah, I've been. I restarted the recording. Okay. Right, right as soon as I recovered the air. Great. So that means uh, can we go back to mowing, like left to right up this wall with quarrels? Sure. Yeah, we're um, we're we're uh, and uh, we're kind of at the edge here for um, Atalanta. It's got kind of a wall in the in the background, so we can p take kind of what we see in front of us and kind of. Uh, and kind of go back down the wall a little bit. Um, this is kind of our furthest reach uh, forward, unless we bump a little, a little closer, which I can do. Um, and then, because uh, I, I think there was a bit of ground there that we didn't didn't quite cover. But uh, Travis, if there's anything you're seeing or a direction you want to go, um, let us know. All right, great, thank you. I think that's a prim noid on the right side, the the white finger one. And then maybe that yellow one is a Chrysogorgia, but I can't quite tell from here. No. Hmm. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that that you should have leash if you go to the um, to your port side kind of uh, straight there, that'll, this whole box in here. This was an older common and I think we got distracted that I, I didn't get to it, but um, they put in an odd word for us, since we like odd words, and it's a reference to mowing the lawn. So Travis, you just said mowing the lawn, right? Mm -hmm. So it's called Bostro pendon. Pendon. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Like I said, I'm not very good at pronunciations, but Bostro pendon. And it's a word meaning literally turning like oxen in plowing. So it's spelled B O U S T R. Bostro feeden? Feeden? Bostro feeden. All so right. So instead of if you want to switch it up from mowing the lawn, you can say Bostro Feed <laughs> All right. Well, we got to get everyone on board with, uh, <laughs> with that one. Maybe we could simplify I it like to just Bostro. <laughs> <laughs> Learn something new every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's a comment saying, amazing there are waves, rivers and lakes deep under the ocean. Yeah, there's some really incredible uh, footage from these hypersaline pools. Um, some of the ones I saw were somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico, but you can check it out. They took a submersible down and literally looked like an underwater lake. And on the edge of it, there was a full waterfall just sort of trickling out of it of this hyper, hyper dense water. Um, and there was sort of a graveyard of organisms in it uh, that it sort of ventured in and uh, was killed by how, how salty it was. Uh, pretty amazing. And actually, that's how sort of our global ocean circulation works, too. We have these massive waterfalls in the, the North water. Atlantic transferring water to uh, from the surface down to the deep sea. Uh, just to let everybody know, I think we'll probably want to pull off bottom around 710, so just a few minutes here left. This All right. is a really nice looking Thank you. sponge yeah. here. Zach, do you have a fun fact, that little-known fact to share? Mm, I don't, honestly, I was thinking more about that term that they just, that they just taught us. <laughs> <laughs> and it reminded me um, of, of my calculus class in college. Our professor would always use the word penultimate whenever penultimate. he could. Instead of the second to last day, we'd always be like, oh, it's almost Friday. It's the penultimate like, it's the day. It's the penultimate day of the week. <laughs> or this is the penultimate class before your exam. And it was, it was a new word. And by the end of that semester, we were all just using it for fun. Cause it was, so it, it's one of those things. It's funny, you know, you use these simple terms, and there's yeah. always a fancy way to say it, too. Um, I don't know, fun facts about the ocean? Um, oh, man. I'll have to think for a bit on that one. I'm sure I've got something. 
Dan, do you have any fun facts? Fun facts. Oh. What's the other, what's the one the Earth's covered in, you know, 80% ocean? Yeah. Yeah, that's a fun fact. That is a good fact. One of our viewers is saying that uh, they love looking at underwater lakes, the brine pools and sulfur pools, especially ones near hydrothermal vents. So fragile and so cool. Oh, there's a goosefish on the right. Oh, Ooh, fish with That's the feet. That's three, three goosefish. Yeah. We don't need to stop and see it, but you know, just <laughs> I was going to say, do, should, I it it? should I highlight it? Should I highlight it? Pointing it out as we go through. Would that be three geese fish? Geese fish. Yes. <laughs> do we have a flock now? Oh Our purpose is coral and photogrammetry. <laughs> Easily distracted here in the back row. <laughs> I just called it in the fisheye lens. So I was like, once again, another another bonus of the fisheye. Yeah. Fish in the fisheye. Now like, it looks like we have three of them because it's in the main and then each of the fisheyes. <laughs> But it looks like the environment's more silty, which means we shouldn't see as many corals. Yeah. Well, back on the wall again a little bit. You can see the little coral skeletons sort of scattered throughout, too. Looks like there was a, a rock slide that sort of knocked a couple of those out. There can also be really tremendous landslides in our, in our oceans, um, just like you'd have a from a, from a mountain, but uh, huge swaths of falling rock and rubble um, heading down the sides of continental slopes. Really dramatic, the, the scale of things that can happen in our in our oceans and us as land creatures har hardly ever get a chance to, to look at them. Okay, come up again. One of our viewers shared a fun fact saying we know more about the surface of the moon than the deep sea, and that was one we were talking about earlier in our watch too. So yeah, if you guys have your own fun facts that you want to share out, feel free to send them in and I'll read them out for you. Do you want me to do one last, uh, I could do one last westward ship move yes. if you like. They uh, want us yeah. to follow the fish. They Bridge want another now. 3D fish. <laughs> I think we have lots of 3D fish. Uh, we do we have, quite, we have a, quite a few 3D goose fishes out there now. They put the little purple devil emoji. <laughs> I only want a 3D sea cucumber. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Oh, there's I'm going to look in Costco and what see. What type of coral is that, Travis? Oh, I am not sure. I need to check my, my ID guide. Bamboo. It looked like a bamboo coral. Okay. Bamboo. Yeah. Looked like yeah. it, but any more any more uh, refinement in that would take more of a more of a view there. Yeah. Whether they, it's um, they're the ones that bioluminous if you grab them and shake them. Oh yeah. Yeah. Nice. We did it here uh, yeah, recently. Turned all the lights off on the ROV and got a coral sample, shook it, and it glowed. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, beautiful. Like there's another fun fact. It's another fish. It's another fun fish. Yeah. Quite a few little shrimp in here too. That's what about this little fish. pink on the left hand side right there? That doesn't look like a shrimp. Might be a sea urchin. A little pink thing? That's a yeah, yeah. An urchin and then well, there's a crinoid the there to stuff. the left. That's uh, I'm counting a shrimp. Yeah, what's our shrimp count out? <laughs> Should we start a shrimp count? We got five minutes left. <laughs> yeah, who can count the most shrimp? Here's another one. There's two. Well, we're going to have a very good photogrammetry of this rock wall. Yeah, this, this, yeah, this like is nice going to be footage. cool. 
It's got a lot of features, so a lot of tie points to align to. I have a viewer trying to help me how to pronounce things. And on my phone, I do put in on how to pronounce things, but it, on the computers up here, I don't think I should put a mic on or like the volume on. on <laughs> how do I pronounce this word? <laughs> If you look straight down, there's a goosefish. Ah, uh -huh, yeah. We we need a goosefish count now. What is oh, that, that was, up? That what was, uh, is that five? Four, five? That was five? the same one. Is as that the same? Before. Oh, it was same done. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Faking us out. We uh, just looking at the dive track. We kind of came back. back Sounds yeah, like these are sort ahead. of our final moments of looking at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, we happen to be kind of ascending, and we're already like, sort of set up in our recovery formation. So we're just taking as much time as we can. Um, we've got. Being a little conservative with 20 meters a minute ascent, what have we been doing? Being like more like 25, I think, something like that. So by the time we set up, and then we'll leave some time to get on deck and all that stuff. Uh, still, still uh, should be start starting to come up soon. Sounds good. Thanks for the update. We have a question about, was that the Mbari dive and that they saw the hi highlight and it was so awesome. It's on their YouTube website. Yeah, I think it might have been from Mbari, the the waterfalls. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. It's really incredible footage if, for anyone who hasn't looked at it. Highly recommend. Snipeels? You forget that you're sort of, almost forget that you're underwater because you're looking at water in the water. <laughs> Very confusing perspectives. That happens a lot in like um. Hello, star. When it's you're in star. caves. Yeah, that's a star eating that uh, or yeah. Yeah. little predation there might be approaching the coral to eat the polyps. Yeah. Doesn't seem to be. Doesn't seem to have gotten on it yet, but <laughs> almost yeah. there. Almost there. We've had a couple yeah, sort of pillow stars isn't it? through right. today's right. dive. This. Not sure of the name. Yeah. yeah. Stars munching on corals. Certainly looks like a pillow star. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some of the names, depending on the biologist, um, some of the common names that we say, they are not, they are not uh, respectful of them. <laughs> we had somebody on a couple of cruises ago who was really well accomplished and a great and encyclopedic IDs on everything, and we would say something. It was a colloquial name, and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's <laughs> not what we call, that's not how we call these things, you know. <laughs> being too general to just point at something and say it's that. But, you know, not all of us have all the Latin names memorized. No. But, you know, they, they've been changing some of the the species names around, too. Things that you thought were in one thing, a couple of years go by, and then some new genetic testing and it's like well it's actually in, in this family and so even some of the stuff yeah, even with the the advent of rapid eDNA testing you know, can yeah. be done on, on the vessel within a matter of you know minutes yeah know. well we some names are just confusing too like a fur seal isn't actually a seal it's a sea lion you mm. know and like there's squat lobsters not a lobster it's a crab so but yeah, it's a, it is a really interesting time, though, in terms of the the scientific nomenclature for the genetic tools that we have. We talked a little bit uh, yesterday about cryptic speciation, but also um, sort of in shallow uh, tropical coral reef systems, where most of my work is from. The it's pretty interesting. There's even with the genetic uh, work coming out, there's sort of families being subdivided and several years later reunited. Uh, as the sort of debate continues of uh, how exactly do we classify and, and bend and define these things. Oh, we uh, lost Doppler. With That's the latest evidence. Uh, I'm going to switch you over to USBL just for a second. Okay. Um, I think it's about time to come up just so we have some time in the make sure we're on time for recovery there. All right. Do you want to stop recording? Okay. All right. Looks Probably like we're yep, pretty well set, uh, set up as long as you turn the right way.
recovery will give us some chance to check, uh, catch up on downloading some data from the cameras, which is good. That would be yep. great. <laughs> Get as much off of those as possible. I think today the, our orientations for a lot of this footage looked a lot better based on our some of our testings from from yesterday's footage and the here. day before. So uh, it would be really nice to see what that looks like in, in reality capture as we start putting this together. Yeah, part of the tough part for doing a, a shakedown a lot of for this is that, you know, you can only really test it when it's in the water. But the, you've definitely that, that whole turnaround for, um, you know, Getting, getting, uh, getting the footage topside, then being able to model it, and being able to say, oh, well, you know, we need more separation here, mm -hmm. or we need more separation, say, laterally, uh, and then uh, getting all the uh, getting all the angle aluminum to fit. Absolutely, and and for all right, how are you feeling? All good? Those into come up? cameras yeah. uh, back home that we've been shooting out. everything in in raw files, so it's sort of everything directly as it comes from the, the camera, but these, these file sizes, I think, are something like 40 megabytes per image. And so when you're trying to transfer all of these up uh, through the data transfer, and we're taking, uh, well, four, three images every, uh, every three seconds, and we're filming for, you know, at times hours, this is a lot of data that we're working with. So um, there's only, only so fast that you can move that data and reconstruct the models uh, to try to get closer to this real time. But um, the idea for having that raw imagery is that we can really correct and refine and try to make things look really nice. Um, whereas some of the testing earlier in this, this cruise, you might have noticed uh, that we had 3D models coming up almost in real time. And that was because we had uh, much smaller file formats that were able to transmit more, more rapidly. So it sort of depends what your goals are. Yeah, and there, um, there really is a balance that we're, you know, the there, there's really it's almost like three tight ropes that we're working that we're walking at once. Um, a lot of these sites are, you know, really quite visually stunning. So the, like the uh, columnar formation site, you know, if if. If we're looking at this as our shot to get out here and to, you know, really be able to spend eight hours down there, you know, we want to get the best, absolute best possible quality imagery. But on the other hand, you know, the imagery is really just a starting point. So we've got, you know, if we use a compressed image format, the, you know, the advantage there is, we, you know, we can really, we can focus on, on iterating on our modeling. Uh, that allows us to adjust, oh, you know, we need to, uh, change the position of the cameras on the ROV and we need to fabricate new mounts and you know change angles and do the you know the really hands-on nuts and bolts work but you know what we we lose the archival quality whereas on you know the advantage of the archival quality work is that we've got a product that's going to look good for you know decades and decades but on the other hand you know it uh, sets the the data side of the equation back because of the increased transfer times and um, you know, even you know, we think about being able to stream Netflix or something, watching uh, Ozark or what have you. You know, it's uh, I mean, it's really easy at home. But you know, the uh, the reality is, is before this footage even hits the ship, it's got twenty thousand feet of fiber it has to go through. And uh, you've you've heard me drop off SPL a couple times. Uh, the you know the the tight the final kind of tightrope we're walking is that we're trying to download as fast as possible. But if we download too fast, we'll actually lose control of the cameras. And, uh, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've slipped a little bit. <laughs> we, have, we haven't, you know, we haven't fallen off the tightrope, but we've, you know, we had a couple, had to uh, restart a couple processes, so. Here's, well, a, here's a question for you. Um, how would different wavelengths of light impact a camera's ability to see in the deep ocean? Do higher frequency bluer lights work best? Yeah, so there's, um, so seawater does not, so, you know, at, at the depths we're at, like there's no natural light at all. Um, but seawater actually absorbs different wavelengths of lights first. Uh, we, we would say scientifically it has higher attenuation at certain wavelengths. And that's why if you were to go, so if, if you imagine you're in a bubble or something and you go, 
you know, you're right at the ocean surface, and then you go down two or three meters, and then you go down to 10 meters. Um, so the first color that you lose is red. Uh, red light is attenuated very quickly on the seafloor, and that's why uh, one of the things, you know, so you notice how the, the corals in the image, is, I mean, they show up as, as white. Um, white balancing in uh, seawater is actually really kind of a challenge because, you know, that kind of um, red light being attenuated, like that doesn't really happen naturally anywhere in air. Like air, you know, over short distances, air kind of attenuates everything equally. And air really doesn't attenuate light much at all. Otherwise, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be like, you know, bright out. Um, so the definitely the fact that we lose red so quickly, it can definitely make it a bit of a challenge because it's so unique to the offshore environment. And, and for you, uh, for those of you at home, if you want to visualize this, see this, if you want to pretend like you're diving, this is an experiment I did with my students exact right before I came out here on Nautilus, kind of a prep them for me coming out here, but it's one of my favorite labs I do every year with my students. I took old folders and I cut out shapes of eyes and I put blue film behind it. So I have one, it's like one layer of blue film. It represents shallow water. And then I put like four layers of blue film to represent the deep water. And then I took a black piece of construction paper and then I cut out little squares of Roy G. Bit, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, or I just did purple. <laughs> and um, and then black and white squares. So when you spread them out, I had like six of each square. And then you have this, um, your student or kid put on the, wear the shallow one and try and pick out the, and so you give them seven minutes and I do a four finger and thumb because you don't want them to do too many and be like, okay, pick the ones you can see the easiest. Those are the prey that you're eating. And you do it several times, like four different rounds. And then you put the thicker glasses on and they'll see how much harder it is to see. And so at the beginning in the shallow, you can see that red color, but once you get deep, you lose the red. So like you start to see maybe more the orange, spectrum but you can't really see the red and then to really show it just hold up the red and the black piece of paper with that thicker blue film on and be like point to the red one and sometimes they can do it and sometimes they can't depending on how thick you made the film but it really shows you that that red light gets absorbed by this blue filter that's made in the water it's kind of a fun little home experiment you can do but we have started our ascent to the yes. surface. So we are currently at um, 674 meters. So if you have any questions, write them in before we end this uh, dive here. So once we hit 50 meters, we're gonna turn off the, the questions in SPL. But yeah, if you have any last minute questions, put them in. Well, it's been an exciting dive, I'll tell you. Yeah. So we started off, and right when we got down, we were in a school of, was it grenadiers? Yes, school of um, grenadiers. The fish. Um, they were about, you know, 7 to 50 meters off, you know, off, and there were just hundreds of them. So very interesting. I think, you know, I haven't seen that, you know. That was really fun. So that was really cool. And then we mapped the top of the seamount, so or the pinnacle, so that we could essentially uh, get a good idea of what the coral is at the top since we essentially transected from the bottom up. And then um, as we started, then we started the Norbits survey. So we took a sonar and looked through and then midway through we got called on a essentially a rogue or a floating line. So this is one of those things where don't put your nets and don't cut your lines because Hercules what, gets cut off. <laughs> which someone wrote into the chat here that we should have a VR 3D rope cutting. So we could add that to the Nautilus video game, you know, simulate. We, uh, we, we got the footage of that. <laughs> we so do have this yeah, footage of it. So we can make it into a VR game part of it, you know? Yeah. You become Hercules. Can you maneuver it? Yeah. No. Yeah. We got the. New, actually, we today we had uh, when all that happened. We we had everything set up for the the um, the VR headset. You know the basically the cameras and the eye positions. Mm -hmm. So uh, f I guess uh, I mean there's never a good time to have a nut fouling, but uh, <laughs> or uh, sorry a line fouling hurt. But you know hey at least we had the right cameras for it. <laughs>
Um, I am getting a couple of messages about people wanting copies of the still images for this dive, so I'm going to have to drop off SPL, yeah. but right. it has been a pleasure sitting in the back row with you all today. Thank, Thank you, Thank you for so all much. your knowledge. You did a wonderful job, like always. <laughs> so we found out that Hercules is armed. They have a knife. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Don't they, mess with her. I know. No. You know. I now know not to do that. So. And it looked pretty sharp. It didn't... It, got through that Made rope. It was a pretty, that, pretty yeah, thick line. rope there. That was a pretty thick line. Yeah. I, was, I was, you know, a lot of force in those manipulators. Then, yeah. you know, what was surprising is we continued on yeah. and <laughs> just like nothing happened, you know, just by the talent of the team here, continued on, got the mission done and uh, they surveyed to the bottom. And then when we took over on our shift, we found a bunch of features here. So we were able to do some photogrammetry on a couple of really cool features and that's going to be useful to reconstruct and then later on they can uh you know dr courtney's group can start to count the coral and analyze and start to make these connections of well where are they on what you know are, are they on substrate where are they at you know maybe we're do some flow and say are they there because we think the flow is coming so that's where they feed and then we also had that beautiful six gill um, ray yes, sighting yes. as well. So That's in a nice the highlight. yeah, in the chat, they'd like us to do a poll of what would you want to see in the blue water. Ooh, Ooh. I'm gonna go with orca. Orca? Yeah, I don't I think we get we orcas. don't get orcas in Hawaii. None. I don't think so. Well, yes, I think it's very rare. If it is, if they come down here, it's very very yeah. rare. Yesterday, as we were coming up, we saw ink. Yeah, we did see so, ink. We got inked. I, you know, one of the things I like to go back and see is footage. Was that was that you know was that really an octopus that we ran into? And I think they, they saw squid from squid? the. We went through. We saw a couple squid. There were squid when we squid. went through that. Yeah. So at the same time. So that was you know that was a cool sighting. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you saw the ink, and you're like, where did that come from? I'll go with whale too, but instead of orca, I'll go, how cool would it be of the first humpback whale for humpback season was us coming up on our dive here? That would be cool. Very exciting. Once again, we're seeing a number of fish. I think they're grenadines. Oh uh, so yeah, looks kinda, like You kind of see what we were seeing a little bit. Yeah, not quite as many so far, but it's still a lot more than we would expect. Yeah, just floating around. Maybe we're kind of getting into the bottom band of that grenadier. Um, yeah, looks like yeah, the school we saw at the start. Yeah, yeah, looks like we're seeing some of them. Uh, so the next dive is scheduled for tomorrow at noon Hawaii Standard Time. So, and do you know what the plan is for the next one? I do not. We, not. we always keep missing the meeting because they yes. do the meeting while we're on watch here. So, which is unfortunate because we can't give you guys an update. But stay tuned to look up into our Nautilus Live website and we will put an update then. But it will be, it's scheduled for noon. We have our crew transfer in the morning. Yep. So noon tomorrow, Pacific Standard Time. Once again, I'm just amazed by the number of fish on yeah. set one as we come up mm -hmm. through. They're now all, all we need is column. like a big megalodon coming out from the deep and just how yeah. <laughs> about that, that as my, can I change my answer? Sure. Find yeah. a new, an extinct shark. Because <laughs> we're coming up on 500 meters, so we're still fairly deep. We are still fairly deep. Yeah. And we just hit 500 oh. right now. Yeah, so the seamount was what, 600 What's that? meters? Just close up, Grenadier. It looks like it. Looks it. Oh, thank you for the shout out saying I had good dialogue. I appreciate it. <laughs> A beaked whale would be cool to see, someone in the chat said, and I agree. Oh, nice. Beaked whale would be pretty cool. Kristen, what would you hope to see? We have Kristen join us in, in the data logger seat. I think I'd like to see an octopus. Mm. Oh, that'd be fun. What about an octopus just hanging on to Herc's face? 
That would be that would be <laughs> incredible. <Yeah. laughs> we had a sea cucumber the other night. We did have that hitchhiker yeah. the other oh, night. Yeah. yeah. But we know Herc has the knife now. Him. Yeah. Er, Herc <laughs> battling the uh, octopus with the knife out. Sounds like a good VR movie. Yeah. <laughs> Do we still have that knife? Did we lose that knife or was it safely stowed back away? That seemed to me almost the hardest part is to put the knife yeah. back. Looked like they had it stowed. We'll find out on deck for yeah. sure. I don't want to find out on deck. But yeah, I'm not getting anywhere <laughs> close to Herc after what I saw today. That's for sure. <laughs> I think they're if you are watching on the live fees and you go over the ROV hangars, definitely already getting ready and prepped for Herc's retrieval. I don't think anyone said a manta ray. Manta ray would be cool. We that definitely have fun. manta rays off the big island. More on the Kona side. If you ever want to go swim with um, manta rays on the big island, you head on over to Kona. It is tremendous. It is tremendous. I highly love it. Yes. Um, they use blue lights. And so how it is is they put these blue lights in the water, and the blue light attracts the plankton, and the manta ray comes up to eat the plankton. So. Um, you get the, and you're, you just have like a manta ray in your face. Like I was looking down the mouth of a manta ray and I thought it was about to be, it was like one of those moments where I was like, am I about to be smacked in the face by the fin of a manta ray? <laughs> and I was like, I kind of want this to happen. Like, yeah. I kind of want to be slapped in the face by a manta ray, <laughs> but they just skimmed it. Like you, yeah. uh, they never actually ended up hitting you. Just, you kind of float at the top. Hold these little pool noodles, and you, and you wonder if you're about to get slapped in the face by a manta ray. They are big. Yeah, they are big. It's amazing the size. This is when I really need the cyclops, because you know. You can really see up yeah, and down ah, the fish eye when yeah. you're coming up. That would be nice. Give you really good views of what's around us. I and that's th the thing. Like maybe there is the sperm whale just hanging out yeah. on the on our side, and we just we just missing it. And he's looking at us, being like, "What is this big, loud, noisy thing here?" Well, that's the nice thing about this. You know, this institute is always improving. So I, you know, next year this may be just the fish eyes is a standard thing we have on there. Oh, so sorry, I lied. You guys can't see the hangar. The control van is on channel three. Would you guys rather see the hangar oh, instead of the us? Hangar. There we go. Then we just switch it. You see, Rachel is down down there. Yep. So yeah, if you're watching the hangar feed now, which is on satellite three, that is Rachel, who was um, our video engine or data engineer, not video engineer, data engineer, helping us answer some of those questions up here. So since her face is not on the website, check out the satellite feed to see what Rachel looks like. <laughs> That's the deck frog. Deck frog. Satellite three. Mm -hmm. I feel like the deck frog needs to be like sticking on a tongue or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Put a little tape down on the deck to make a little tongue. That'd be fun. Pretty cute right now. It's got a little frown almost though. Frown, I think it's just a be <laughs> smiley face. <laughs> I 
So for those watching at home, remember you also, if you have any students in classrooms or universities or even library, any groups, if you want to talk to us, you can set up a ship to shore interaction and you can have a one-on-one -on -one interaction between a group, like a classroom and our science communication fellows on board. And you can even request if you want someone else also to be in there. So if you want to learn a little bit more about our ROVs, a little more about navigation, video engineering. So check out the different resources that we have available on nautiluslive.org. And you can find that information under the education tab. So go under education and then click on ship to shore interactions to find out more about them. And we do do these around the world. Um, so any time zone you would like. Someone says it's a satisfied deck frog. That's what the face is making. <laughs> So instead of catching frogs, our deck frog catches ROVs. Got oh, him, look at that. Kind of looks like a little fly when it comes up. Yeah, it kind of yeah. does. Yes. Especially, I think Atalanta, when Atalanta comes on, looks like the nose actually, and kind of sits right there too. Yeah. Kind Good of point. completes the face a little more. Oh, we got lasers into the, uh, the ocean there for a little bit. Yeah, so we haven't been using the lasers. I know before one was broken, but I think yeah. it's fixed now. But we're not using them because of the video imagery that we're doing. Is that the main reason? Yeah. Go ahead, Travis. Yeah, so we're mapping everything so you don't want the green blurs <laughs> and lines like. all over it. We just turn them on every once in a while so we can have a nice uh, scaling. Yeah. So we know how big uh, our region is for our measurements. But... So what language are available for interaction? So that does depend on who's on board. Um, I think Ale speaks Spanish, but I'm not 100% sure on that. But we do have some other crew members that speak Spanish. Um, sometimes um, we have Olelo Hawaii, but on this expedition, we do not have anyone I, that speaks Olelo Hawaiian on this one. Um, previous ones we have. So yeah, it's kind of unfortunately just English for this one. We're not. We're not very talented, I'm sorry. I blame my parents. Sorry, Mom and Dad. It's your fault. <laughs> we did, um, on an earlier one, we had Chris on board, and he um, did ASL sign language, so that was really oh. cool. He would do interactions in sign language. Again, I'm not that talented. Our current depth is 259 meters and our temperature has increased. So at the bottom we're around five degrees Celsius and now we're up to 13 degrees Celsius. All right, heating up. Yeah. Getting closer to that warm water at the surface. About ha halfway there in our ascent. I have to say, I'm since I live, I've been living in Hawaii now for seven years. I'm a bit of a baby. Like our water temperature here actually does not change substantially a lot. But you know, when you get spoiled, you get used to like, like in the summer, the water is co cool, but it's not. You know, like I feel like Florida, the water can get really hot in the summer, almost yes. bathtub. I think this summer it actually hit over 100 degrees Fahrenheit off of Florida. Whereas here is kind of year round in the 70s, I think, is it around our surface temperature. And but in winter, it does just get slightly colder. And, you know, me being spoiled, I'm like, ooh. So like I have have to have a reason, like I'm going to go diving or go snorkeling or, or boogie boarding to get in the water. I don't just decide to go swim for fun in winter. <laughs> you wear a wetsuit? 
Uh, no, no. <laughs> you'd get you'd get laughed at in Hawaii if you wore a wetsuit. <laughs> you can maybe get away with a rash guard or like, a, but yeah, no, no one wears wetsuits in Hawaii. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't say no one, but... I've seen a couple of spring suits up in the yeah. North Shore, yeah. those like windy days in the winter. Like, yeah. it definitely gets gets a little chilly. It's like those a little bit, like two mil kind of shirts kind of thing, I think get to be worn a little yeah. bit more. I would definitely D have a wetsuit on. I, th I think for diving, I've seen divers still wear wetsuits. Um, I, I usually don't wear a wetsuit when I go diving here though still. Even a hundred, I've gone a hundred feet down diving. Uh, looking for sunrise shells and and when I'm doing stuff I'm not a baby <laughs> like the whole you know when you're walking into the water though and you're like Ooh. but if you if I have a goal then I'm like suck it up <laughs> a bit so of you jump right in or yeah. are you like oh we're taking baby steps oh as I got older I'm definitely uh take baby steps and like <laughs> <laughs> When I was younger, I just dive on in. Yeah, I'm just like, just dive in. Get it makes it so much better. Yes, just dive in. And there's there's this whole series of, of mammalian dive reflexes there too. There is, and it's so. very it's fascinating. Even if you take, I think a lot of people are too scared to let their baby take dive lessons at a young yep. age, but babies have this extinct marine mammal dive reflex. Can you tell us a little more about it? Sure. Yeah. There's a whole series of things. Um, for us in this conversation, if you get your head nice and wet and cold, like your body heats up and sort of responds to it, so it feels a little less jarring. <laughs> um, for yeah, for babies, they're like innately hold their breath when their face hits water. Uh, I was told actually that some babies, if they're not exposed to water early enough, they lose they it. They lose it, they and do. so you actually want to start your swim lessons with babies when they're very very young, yeah. so they like keep that reflex moving forward. Uh, I took a free diving course, which was really interesting, and it's all about how do you engage that mammalian dive reflex of getting your face wet and staying calm, and um, it's really incredible um, once so you're, you know, sort of lean into that, just how much longer you can hold your breath. I've had my students do this experiment before, and so I used to do it, and then now I do it as extra credit, and so what I tell them to do is you take a bucket, and you dunk your head, you sit, right? And you take your heart rate just sitting and you have to hold the same position as you would if your face was in the water because you, you don't want to be changing your variables around. So you sit, imagine your face in a bucket without your face being in a bucket, take your heart rate. And then you do the experiment. So you do that three times, measure your heart rate, and then you do it again. But this time you dunk your face in the cold water and you hold it. So don't try this at home without someone supervising you because I don't want anyone passing out and getting mad at us. But um, hold your breath 30 seconds, 45 seconds, and take your heart rate and measure and do it three times. And you can see actually a decrease in your heart rate. If, you, if you're if you not like, there's always some variables to it. Some people don't like putting their face in cold water and it stresses them out. Um, but overall, you can see this decrease in your heart rate and that is your marine mammal dive reflex kicking in. And it's, I make students um, do this as a extra credit assignment and they have to video themselves. So I get a little enjoyment out of <laughs> watching students dunk their face in ice water and they get extra credit. Oh, we so got a little fish in nice. front of the cam and gone. Nice reminder to keep the eyes on the prize here. Yeah. Get our blue water bucket list. Yeah. I don't think that was on anyone's wish list. <laughs> <laughs> that that was fun. Beggars can't be choosers. No, exactly. <laughs> that was a little excitement. We well, have someone writing in the chat that babies are immune to water. I don't know if I'd say immune to water. You definitely don't just want to start tossing your babies into water, but they definitely, <laughs> they definitely, it's pretty impressive what um, babies can naturally do. There's um, classes you can take to teach your infants how to roll over and float on their back that I highly recommend all parents do because that's one of the, uh, like a pretty big cause of babies accidentally falling into pools. That's a little weird uh -huh. looking. Yeah. What are, what are you? Yeah. 
some, some fun goodies, 110 meters or so. This is this is the time when they start to essentially come up, yeah. right? You know, so it's just 7.40, so it got dark about an hour ago. So now all these small animals will start to make their way up to the surface. And it's the largest migration in the world that happens yeah. every night. Every night, so. The reason these um, zooplankton, so zooplankton are animal plankton, and then we also have phytoplankton, which are our plant plankton. So our plant plankton stays up in our surface, our epipelagic zone, feeding on light to make photosynthesis and making that energy. And our zooplankton doesn't want to be up at the day because that's when all the fish are out and we'll eat them. So the zooplankton kind of migrate up at this time of day, right when it gets dark, feed on all that phytoplankton at night and then go back down in the morning. So this is the largest migration in the world that happens every single day. Yeah, it would be interesting to look at some of that the depth profile data for our temperature and salinity, but you notice that right around 100 meters or so, we saw a lot of that activity. That could be sort of the, the base of the mixed layer here. And our temperature is now up to 25.9 degrees Celsius. So we had a pretty big jump. We're at 77 meters. All right, is that warm enough for you to swim? Uh, it's still a little cold. <laughs> Not, too cold. <laughs> Not quite there yet. <laughs> Not quite there yet. Let's get up a few more meters. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're fastly approaching that 50 meters. So if you have any last comments, get them in. Yeah. So we do have um, someone saying that they saw our vessel pass two nights ago. So yeah, if you're on the south side of Big Island, give us a wave. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. How much water is too much water? Are you talking, I'm assuming this question is reverting back to our babies in the water. And I think it's, it's not that there's too much water, it's just, I mean, if you're, I'd still supervise your children in the pool, like, but, um, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, what are you? Oh, look Flap. at that. Yeah. What is, is that? Is that a pteropod? A little flapping wings? Or maybe some small squid? Oh. Those look like a background. squid. There was some ink as well. That was fun. I think we're right at 50 meters, though, so. Alrighty, we are at yes, 50 meters. Yes, we are. Yeah. All right, everyone have a good night, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks so much, everyone. Good night. Yeah, go ahead. To go ahead, continue with the recovery of both Atalanta and Hercules. Stand by, please. Standing by. Deck Control, can you confirm that we are standing by or are we proceeding? Control Deck, we are standing by for the bridge. Back Deck Bridge. Go ahead, Bridge. Charlie to proceed with recovery. Yeah, Captain, thank you.
control back deck. We have Hercules lining up uh, dead center of the A-frame. Copy. Control, back deck, can we go ahead and have Hercules pull forward, please? Will do. Control, deck, you can go ahead and have Hercules hold there. Roger.
Control, control deck. Can you have Hercules pull forward, please? Roger, will do. Deck control, can you advise, is there a wrap or, or what are we seeing? We have two wraps, two wraps. Copy that, our, uh, our wrap counters are zeroed out, so I'm not sure. Copy that. Control deck, can you have Hercules pull head at half speed? Pulling forward half speed. Control deck, you can go ahead and have Hercules hold there again. Roger.
of Hercules, drive ahead at quarter speed. Driving ahead, quarter speed. Control deck, you guys are 10 meters from the transom. 10 meters high. Control deck, can you have Hercules go ahead and start turning to starboard at 90 degree? Being starboard. Control, can you have Hercules pull ahead slightly, please? Driving ahead. Hercules is past the transom. Past the transom, I. Deck, Hercules is out of the water. Copy. Power secure. Copies.